We found that about 35 to 40% of strata corporations actually aren't calculating their strata fees correctly. As part of our service, we verify that the strata fee is actually right. And oftentimes we, we find errors in that. Hello, everyone. Welcome back to In the House podcast. My name is Tony Singh. Good morning, everyone. I'm Jenny Woon. And today we have a special guest from the island. Ryan Wright, are you located on the island right now? Correct. Yes, I am in Victoria. Awesome. Welcome. We have Ryan Stanquist, the founder and managing broker of Condo Clear. And honestly, what you've created with this company is so cool. We're ecstatic to have you on the podcast today, and we can't wait to share with our listeners. Uh, a lot more about what it is that you guys do. And um, maybe we'll talk a little bit about the industry as well. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. Sounds good. So let's start off, Ryan. We always ask this question. What is your spirit animal? <laughs> what is my spirit animal? Um, you know, I probably have to say a wolf. I uh, prior to prior to getting into the real estate industry, uh, my first business venture ever, the first company I started was actually a dog training company. So I, oh. I, I love dogs. I love the loyalty. I love the dedication. Uh, so I'd have to say a wolf. Good so what, what kind of, do you have a dog right now? Do you have pets? I don't. Um, but I've got something even better, I think. So I live in a large condo building downtown and we have a ton of dogs in our building. So I have a couple dogs that I watch on almost like a daily basis. So I get all the benefits of having a dog without any of the real responsibility or costs that go along with it. So it's a, <laughs> it's a win-win situation. Oh, that's great. Um, share with our listeners who haven't had the opportunity to hear about you before. What is Condo Clear all about? So Condo Clear, uh, I came up with it about five and a half years ago, but what we do is very simple as we take all the strata documents that you get during a during a real estate transaction, we summarize them, uh, and then we try and answer any questions and provide support for buyers and realtors. How did that come, come about though? Actually, that's it's it's a bit of a fun story. So I was prior to Condo Clear, I was a managing broker for for a large strata management company. Um, I had been doing that for quite a few years and I was kind of looking for an exit strategy. And I actually have a group of friends that are mortgage brokers in town that were trying to convince me to come onto their team. And so uh, I decided to kind of take the plunge and I, I ordered my mortgage brokers course. And then that night I was laying in bed and I was thinking about things, kind of strategizing my, my plan. And uh, I, I was thinking, how can I leverage my experience with strata management to serve me as a mortgage broker? And I, started thinking, well, maybe I could review people's strata documents as part of my services as a mortgage broker. And then it kind of snowballed from there. And that night, literally, I'm laying in bed at 1030. Uh, I got up because my mind, mind was just going, I was up the entire night. And by the next morning, I had the outline of my business plan, I had the name, I had everything. Um, and the the research that I did, like I just hopped on Google and started started searching it. And I was like, why did why doesn't this exist? And the funny thing was is that it does exist pretty much everywhere except for BC. Mm -hmm. uh, like Alberta, for instance, this is the standard. Like this has been it since the 90s. Realtors do not review strata documents in Alberta at all. Are there different requirements though, Ryan, between Alberta and British Columbia though? Because, so since we're, we're talking about it, right? Like for example, whenever we're listing a place or we're on the buying end, we review all documents. Mm -hmm. as the agent yeah. and then we come together with our clients so what's the difference between alberta and bc so so the big thing is uh in bc i think the reason why we have this situation is there was some case law from 2006 where uh, a realtor um promised they wouldn't sell their client a, a condo in a leaky condo building uh. Got the documents, didn't bother reviewing them, just passed them along to their client, uh, ended up in a lawsuit. And the, the, the interpretation of that now is that realtors are expected to review the strata documents. Um, 
Whereas in places like Alberta, they recognize that reviewing condo documents is beyond the scope of work and beyond the scope of expertise of a realtor because you're not licensed for strata management. So that's why they 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 uh, recommend that you refer your clients to a to a qualified third party. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. And so, who do you service mainly? Uh, p- primarily, it's buyers. Uh, some, some realtors do, do offer it as part of their services. I mean, that's, that's completely up to the realtor and, and their, uh, business model. Um, but yeah, primarily it's the buyers are our, our clients. Mm-hmm. Okay. So the buyer is the one that's willing to pay the fee for you to review it. And that's typically, uh, referred by an agent because otherwise how would they know about your service? Okay. Okay. Exactly. Yeah. So it's it's really no different than than um, like home inspections. So if you the closest parallel to what I do is is home inspections. And if you look back in the early '90s, only only about ten to fifteen percent of people were getting home inspections. And well, you know today it's it's like seventy eighty percent of people are getting home inspections. So it's it's very similar to that where. Uh, realtors have a lot on their plate as far as negotiating contracts, finding properties, showing properties, that sort of stuff that expecting them to also be fluent in strata stuff is, is, it's a, it's a really difficult position for the realtors to be in, especially because we are, we are licensed, uh, um, uh, trading licensees. I've done the course. the 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 part portion or the chapter on strata management or strata corporations is like seventeen pages long. I mean, that's that's not nearly enough to adequately disseminate this information on behalf of your clients. Mm-hmm. So, Ryan, when we were speaking on the phone last week, um, one of the things that we were discussing, right, was missing strata documents. So, let's say, for example, you are the buyer's agent. And it's your responsibility to go over the documents and your client should as well, right? Um, We were discussing on the phone that, what is it, around 90 to 95% of the time, there's something missing in the strata package that's been given to you from the listing realtor, correct? Absolutely, yeah. So um, if someone was going to, a buyer was going to hire you guys for for the service, um, what is the turnaround time like? And... When do you guys have a quick read through everything to ensure that nothing's missing? Because it does take time to request missing documents through the property management company. Yeah. So, uh, I mean, it's kind of two parts. The first thing that we try to do um, is once we receive the the order form, once we receive the, the document package, we try and go through that as soon as we possibly can. Because like you said, it typically takes a few days before you can actually get your hands on those documents. So that's something that we do right away. We send back a checklist to the realtor and to the buyer. Um, with this process, I, I fully encourage, and ultimately this is this is up to the realtor and their client and how they want to format things, but, but we deal with the realtor one-on-one with the client typically CC'd so they know what's going on the whole time. So that's the first step is, is sending you that list back of anything that's missing. And then as far as the turnaround time to get the review done, it's anywhere from two to five business days, depending on how busy we are, uh, depending on what documents are missing, that sort of stuff. So my, my approach is if you have a um, subject removal that's say next Friday, I will schedule the review for 24 hours before, so Thursday, so that we have time to get those documents. But if we end up obtaining all the documents prior to that, we will we will try and slot it in uh, as early as we possibly can, right? But to me, the priority is not getting the review out as fast as possible. The priority is getting all the documents so we have a full full package of information to look at. Okay. Uh, fun question here. So... <laughs> Do you actually review every single page or is AI doing it? Oh, that's a good question. No, we, as of, as of right now, we don't have any AI systems. It is real live people that uh, come from strata management background. That's the value that we provide is that we have all been on boots on the ground managing strata corporations. Um, I, I have been developing software over the last two or three years that helps streamline what we're doing that may have a machine learning or AI component to it. But ultimately, it's always going to be uh, real live people that are going over that information. 
Okay. <laughs> so if it's not AI, um, how big is your team right now? So you got yourself. Yeah, so we've got uh, three of us that are licensed, and then and then one admin person. Uh, and again, all, all all the licensees, the requirement is that you have hands-on experience with managing strata corporations. And are they working like full time, or are they like they're are they considered freelancers or contractors? They they are contractors. Um, so I mean, as far as full time goes. It can vary, obviously, because the real estate market is is up and down so much. It's like December and January, for instance, is just the slow time in the industry. Um, so I wouldn't say we're full time at that point, but for instance, March and April, like we are, we are extremely busy right now. And and uh, I, I mean, one of my licensees, Megan, she, I saw this morning that she was sending out a review at eleven thirty last night. Mm. So <laughs> we're putting we're putting in a lot of long hours these days. And so. You, you mentioned that you guys are a qualified team. You've all had experience with boots on the ground and property management, which is what allows you to speak to the documents that you're reviewing. Um, what makes you guys different from a lawyer in this position? Mm-hmm. Like, are there certain scenarios where you'd have to refer something out? Yeah, absolutely. And that's, that's, that's a great question. I was actually hoping you were going to ask that. Um, so we, since, since the beginning I kind of saw lawyers as potentially our competition uh, because there are some lawyers, especially the law firms that do a lot of conveyancing work that do offer some strata document review services as part of what what they do. But what I ended up finding was that we've had a huge amount of support from the law community because ultimately they don't want to do it. It's not an effective use of their time. And they don't have, when, when a lawyer is looking at strata documents, they're looking at through, through a legal scope. They're not looking at the building maintenance. They're not looking at the bylaw violations, what kind of community it is, which is a huge thing that I try to stress on buyers is that you're not just buying into a property, you're buying into a community. So that community, if it doesn't fit your your uh, lifestyle, your demographic, then you can have potential issues with that. So um, it works really well because most lawyers, if they're reviewing strata documents, it's going to take them three or four or five hours to go through these hundreds of pages. Well, most lawyers are charging $300 plus an hour. So if you're looking at paying a lawyer $1,200 to review all the strata documents, we can do it for $400. We can point out anything that, that may require legal advice. And now that lawyer is looking at one specific thing, that's probably only going to take them half an hour or an hour to look at rather than the full three or four or five hours to go through the documents. So it, it, it typically ends up being even cheaper if you have to, if you go through condo clear and then you still have to get legal advice. I have a second part question mm-hmm. to the lawyer part, <laughs> just listening yeah, to you absolutely. speak, because it's true that there's so much in the strata documents, community, uh, building health, possibly uh, financials, engineering reports, all of those kinds of things. So we talked a little bit about the lawyers, but what about the financial statements? How mm-hmm. much dedication are you guys giving towards that? And it's a lot too, right? I mean, you could actually run that by an accountant. Absolutely. Yeah, there there are some situations where we will come out of doing a review and and say to the to the buyer, to the customer that, hey, you might want to get an accountant to look at this because something's not right. Um, that being said, one of my big standards is is anybody that's doing the reviews has a has a good grasp on the accounting side of things, which is which is kind of a um it's it's not very common, right? Like a lot of people don't don't fully grasp numbers and don't fully grasp the accounting side of things. So just for instance, out of the three licensees, myself included, uh, both myself and Megan are managing brokers. So um, through the managing brokers course, the the section on accounting is actually quite quite significant. It's quite robust. So you need to understand accounting in order to obtain your managing brokers license. Uh, Mugarel. He is not a managing broker license as of yet. He is looking at taking it in the near future, but but he has both Megan and I to lean on if he has questions about the accounting. But yeah, there there are definitely situations where where we say, hey, you might want to go and actually clarify with the Strata Corporation what's going on here because these numbers don't add up. The numbers that are on the balance sheet don't add up with what's in the income statement. The numbers on the balance sheet itself don't make any sense. They're missing things or, or these numbers don't actually track. So um, there are situations, but I would say that's 
less often than say, hey, you may need to go get a lawyer's opinion on this particular thing, especially with the recent changes in the legislation. Mm -hmm. So you brought up the case law in 2006 where a realtor, uh, you know, knowing that the buyer didn't want to go into a leaky condo, but then they he didn't bother or she he, she or didn't he or she didn't bother reviewing the documents. Um, how about what if you miss something? You mm. you forgot to highlight something. What what uh, kind of insurance coverage do you have? Um, and and yeah, the uh, the amount of pressure that you would have to to ensure that you're bringing things up. Uh, good good question. So ultimately, I don't know for sure because that has not happened yet. We're we're five and a half years in. We're about twenty five hundred reviews deep at this point. That hasn't happened. We haven't had anything even remotely close to that at this point. But. The best I can figure, um, and this is based on conversations with, with well, it was RECBC, now it's BCFSA. I've had conversations with the Real Estate Errors and Omissions Corporation. I've had legal opinions, et cetera, et cetera. Um, the best answer I can give you is, again, look at the, the, the home inspection kind of, kind of uh, parallel is that if you refer your clients to a qualified home inspector and they miss something, well, you as a realtor did your due diligence. You referred your clients to who is supposed to be a third party uh, qualified professional. They missed something that would mitigate your liability as a, as a realtor to, to a large degree. Um, but ultimately it's that that's their role. So the same thing with us is if, if, if we are, engaged to review the strata documents and we miss something, uh, we would likely end up wearing the majority of that liability. Now, as far as insurance goes, because we are licensed, we are licensed through BCFSA, we're all licensees, we're covered by the same real estate errors and omissions insurance that you are. But because this is such a new service and there's never been any any lawsuits or disciplinary actions surrounding this service specifically, we don't know what would happen. So we also do have uh, third party liability insurance or, or uh, E&O insurance as well. Yeah, perfect. That makes sense. That's smart. Liability insurance. Okay, yeah. <laughs> How do you um, stay up with all of the changes in the strata legislation and regulations? Um, so we even there have been a lot of changes this year, right? Or from last year into this year. Mm. How do you guys stay up to date on that? Uh, well, for me personally, I can say that I'm one of the reasons why I've succeeded both in strata management and now with condo clear is that I'm a total law nerd. Like I, mm. I, I, I read case law for fun. Like it's, it's, <laughs> it's ridiculous. <laughs> I find, I find it really interesting. That's, that's just, cool. that's just what I do with my spare time. Right. Um, so that's the big thing, but there's also tons of resources out there. Like we, we send out educational emails on a weekly basis, which uh, is beneficial to, to, to realtors and, and to clients, but it's also beneficial to us because if you come up with a topic and you say, Hey, this could be an interesting topic. Well, you got to research that topic before you can speak, um, competently on it. So that helps keep us up to date. But there's also like the SOA, the Vancouver Island Strata Owners Association, CHOA, of course, the Condominium Homeowner, Homeowners Association. They have mailing lists that we are subscribed to. Um, I also have my Google alerts set up for keywords like strata and condo that I get emails every morning with, with uh, any news or any media stuff uh, in regards to that. There's also a lot of strata lawyers like Elaine McCormick and, and um, um, Justin Hansen that, that put out newsletters and stuff like that on a monthly basis. Um, going back to the case law thing, there's also the civil resolution tribunal, which handles a ton of strata dispute stuff. Well, you can subscribe to all their decisions. So pretty much every morning, well, it's funny because actually <laughs> their, their emails come in at midnight every night for some odd reason, but I get those emails uh, every day with any decisions that have come out of the CRT. So that's that's primarily how we stay up to date with anything that's going on. Ryan, I can tell that that like looking at the data and everything really excites you. So it's wonderful that you've made this business because <laughs> you're really on top of everything. Yeah. yeah. And out of curiosity, because we have to take uh, 18 credits for every two years to get relicensed. What are the requirements for property managers with BCFSA? Well, so the, the, Difference with that is, is most of those credits uh, are not actually for your license. That's for your standing as a, as a 
as a realtor through the Canadian Real Estate Association and or uh, I believe some of the local real estate boards also have mandatory courses or credits that you have to take as well. So that's different because we may be licensed for trading services, which is required for what we're doing, but we're not members of any local real estate board we're not members of the bc real estate association etc so we don't have to fulfill that requirement of obtaining those credits but we do still have to do things through the bc fsa so um the legal update every two years and because we're all licensed for strata management as well as trading services we have the option of doing the strata management one or the trading services one and quite frankly our our focus is more on the strata side of things because we're not actively engaged in buying and selling properties. So it's it makes more sense for us to stay up to date with what's going on on the strata side of things than it does sure. the, the trading side of things. Yeah. Um, and then, of course, when we have other courses come up, like like the money laundering and FinTrack and that sort of stuff, we, we're required to do that to uh, maintain our licenses as well. Mm -hmm. um, one question I have is you're only reviewing the documents that you're given, right? So for example, you're not looking at, you're not going onto other websites to see if it's a stigmatized property or if it has had any um, issues with like a police file or anything like that. I'm assuming that you're not looking beyond just what you're given in terms of the checklist. Correct. Okay. You're just yeah. going back for the required two years though, right? Two years for all of the minutes. And is it five years engineering or you're not going back that far? You wouldn't say, hey, Tony, it's missing uh, an engineering report that was that was supposed to have happened four and a half years ago. So yes and no. So there's a lot of things that we that we discover through the course of doing the review that because uh, ultimately we don't know if a building has had any engineering reports until we've actually read all the minutes and that sort of thing. So um, we do highlight that stuff quite oftentimes when we do a review, even if we have the whole document package, all the things that we want, like the minutes and the bylaws, et cetera. Once we do the review, there may be a number of other reports that were mentioned in the minutes that were not provided, which which should have been provided right off the bat. Um, as far as reviewing those things go, reviewing engineering reports is considered additional to, to, to our standard scope of work. However, we very rarely actually have to charge extra for it because the approach that we take is we look at what is in the minutes. And if the Strata Corporation is well managed, then they should have a good synopsis of what's going on within the minutes themselves. But we also do look at the reports in a very, very brief manner. So if a report was done by a good engineering company or, or, or a good, good consultant, typically those are going to have an executive summary. So you might have a hundred page engineering report, like a building envelope condition assessment, uh, but that's typically going to come down to one page where they give you an executive summary of what's going on, as well as an opinion of any probable costs if they require a building envelope remediation or deck remediation. So we will look at just that portion of it. But as far as going through the report in detail and disseminating that, disseminating that information, we don't typically get into that unless unless the, the, the customer really wants it or, or if there's big questions that are left unanswered. Mm -hmm. What would you say is the biggest myth or challenge in your industry? Um, well, the biggest challenge for sure is the document side of things. And this is this is interesting because it was completely unforeseen for me. When I first started Condo Clear, I did I did not envision actually getting the documents as being being a difficult thing because ultimately it seems like it should be a really simple thing. Here's the documents for the last two years, here's all the minutes, here's any reports, here's a copy of the insurance certificate. That should be really simple, but it's turned out to not be like that is a that is a huge challenge. Quite frankly, we would be able to turn around reports in, in way faster if we were actually able to get our hands on all the documents. Um, with some files, we spend more time trying to get our hands on the documents than we do actually reviewing those documents. And is this because the property manager is doesn't have like the full package delivered all at once? Like, where can you point the fingers? <laughs> <laughs> um, I mean, it, ultimately, it starts with the Strata Corporation, right? Because that is the source of these documents, the Strata Corporation slash the management company. And we see situations on a fairly regular basis where, where we send out the list uh, to the, the buyer's agent who we're working directly with. They send that to the listing agent. The listing agent sends that to, to the management company or the Strata Corporation. And then we get a response back saying, oh, we just onboarded this building six months ago and the previous management company didn't provide those documents. Um, 
to me, I, I, I typically encourage the realtor to push back on that because ultimately that management company, the new management company, it's their fiduciary and, and most likely their contractual duty to be the custodian, custodian of those documents. So if they haven't, if these things are missing and they haven't bothered to track them down or put a significant effort into doing so, then, then that's, to me, that's an issue. They're not fulfilling their, their obligations. So it does often go back to the, to the management companies. Like it's just something that, I feel and this this comes through my experience as being a managing broker and a strata manager, but strata the strata management business is is extremely difficult. There are so many things going on. Finding finding staffing, especially experienced people, is very difficult. So a lot of times the things that should be simple get overlooked because it's not the thing that's right in your face. Right? So um it is something that that I'm continuously trying to improve throughout the industry. For instance, uh, being in Victoria, that that's been our primary market since day one. We're just now in the last year expanding into the Lower Mainland and and the interior, that sort of thing. And it it kind of um, I actually had a moment a couple of days ago where I, where I had some appreciation because most of the management companies in Victoria now are providing all these documents by default, like the, the AGM notice packages, which we get pushback on from management companies a lot, but the companies here in Victoria, because we're doing so much volume as far as condo document reviews go, they've now adopted to providing those documents by default. Whereas now in Vancouver and, and Kelowna and Kamloops and those areas, we still see those things missing on a regular basis because they're not as accustomed to getting get, getting asked for it. So my, my hope is that uh, the longer we provide the service and the more education we can provide to realtors and strata managers, the better it's going to be for everybody. Ryan, thank you for what you're doing for the industry. <laughs> the standard of care is very important. What? <laughs> and he can start another business. Yeah. You can sell the strata documents for a lot less money. <laughs> well, actually, that's right. a question for later because I know that you're yeah. working on something else as well, possibly a Ooh. new business, which we can talk about. But y'all are going to have to listen to the end of the podcast because we still have more questions. Ryan. <laughs> um, so, Ryan, in your opinion, how and like because you're looking at standard of care and all these things and you're kind of you're a managing broker but also on the property management side what do you think the standard of care for realtor licensees should be on the listing selling side for getting those documents and verifying everything's there etc cetera, etc cetera, and the buyer's agent side i want to also preface this mm -hmm. as well tony reads e I read every document <laughs> i actually read zero documents I, I don't read a single thing. That's why, but that's why I know that what Ryan's saying too, like they either don't have the documents, wrong information was given. They don't give the uh, notices. Oh, okay. I'll correct. So annoying. I'll correct. I'll correct. I, as a listing agent, <laughs> I make sure all the documents are there. Oh, wonderful. As a buyer's agent, I don't, I don't advise yeah. because I, it's just be again, beyond my scope. And what I find important, they may not find important. What they find important, I'm like, what the heck? Fair. Why would you find that important? So anyways, Let's we could just hire back to your Ryan question. and Condo Clear though to yeah. <laughs> <laughs> then you don't have to worry about it exactly. Yeah. Um, so on the listing agent side of things, and this is this is interesting because I, I talk to a lot of realtors that don't actually fully realize this, but but the listing agent does have some responsibilities, obviously, namely providing those documents. Um, and again, going back to that ninety five percent number, we talked about kind of the source of that issue, but it's also a failure on multiple levels because we have listing agents that may be requiring all the documents that may be in your request, but what is actually provided is often different than what you actually requested. Like for instance, the the, the standard subject says specifically any professional or engineering reports. And we continuously see those things not being provided. Um, so for the listing agents, you need to make sure that you go through those documents in detail. You need to go through every set of minutes, cross-reference uh, each set of minutes with the previous set of minutes that was approved at that meeting. Uh, make sure those were all provided because we constantly see missing minutes. Um, depreciation reports is a big thing where uh, so often we will receive the depreciation report, but the depreciation report will be in draft form. It'll be incomplete. It won't have the funding models included in it. Um, the AGM and SGM notice packages, which actually aren't part of the, the standard subject, but really should be. Um, one kind of really redeeming part for me is that when I first started Condo Clear five and a half years ago, 
uh, I used to go into presentations and brokerages and stuff and, and really encourage realtors to obtain a copy of the insurance certificate. Because at that point, the insurance certificate was not part of the standard Form B package. And the, the responses I had back from realtors all the time was like, oh, well, it's a strata corporation. They have to have insurance. So why do we need a copy of the insurance certificate? And now fast forward uh, three years to the insurance crisis. And now that the spotlight's on that. And I was like, see, this is why you need to do this. Because even prior to the, the insurance crisis coming up in, in early uh, 2020, I guess it was, uh, there was buildings that had major claims histories that were having two hundred thousand or two hundred fifty thousand dollars deductibles and were having large increases in their in their premiums and potentially risking not having insurance because of that bad loss history. So um, to get back to to listing agents, you are you should be verifying that everything was provided that you requested, but you also need to disclose certain things. So um, whether or not there's any special levies coming up, whether or not there's a AGM or any bylaw resolutions coming up, all of these things should be indicated in the form B. So you should be disclosing that upfront to, to any potential buyers um, as well as any material bylaws. Mm, I have a question about that. I've also had form Bs sent to me that were wrong. So it's, it's super annoying though, right? Because we're relying on the information that's provided from the property management company. All that we'd really be able to do is say, hey, listen, this doesn't appear accurate. Please double check your records and then get back. Do you know what I mean? Like that's. Absolutely. Yeah. It. Yeah. OK. Sorry. Continue. Yeah. 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 So that's 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 the other part of things. So whether or not a, a listing agent would be responsible for verifying the information in the form B, I would say probably not. But again, I'm, I'm not a lawyer, of course. Um, but at least if there is something significant on that form B, that should be disclosed up front to any, any buyers. Uh, and again, with bylaws. So any material bylaws, um, well, rental restrictions aren't, aren't, aren't really a thing anymore, but short-term rental restrictions, if there's age restrictions, 55 plus, obviously section bylaws is, is a big thing. And there's actually, um, I've only heard this through the grapevine, but there is a case in Victoria right now where, where, um, a, a buyer had their documents reviewed by, by somebody else in town, wasn't us. Uh, they went through the depreciation report, um, Nobody advised the clients that it was a section building. Oh. So they only received one form B. They purchased the property from what I understand. And, and again, I don't have firsthand knowledge of this, but they, they, they purchased the property, then found out that their strata fee wasn't $320 a month. Well, their strata fee was, but there's also the residential section fee, which was an additional $200 on top of that. So that's resulted in, in and that's, that's in the bylaws. You need to review the bylaws and make sure that, everything that's material is disclosed to people that's ma major that's mm -hmm. unfortunate mm -hmm. <laughs> yeah well and we we do see a lot of buildings um more so in the interior uh than we do on the lower mainland and in victoria that that are section buildings as per their bylaws but they're not operating as section buildings whatsoever and sorry, yeah, go ahead. Yeah, question about yeah. Um, one thing that I heard you say that we should actually receive AGM and SGM notices. Mm -hmm. It's actually not in our clause. So would you suggest that we put add that it. in there, add that in? Mm -hmm. I would, yeah. So there's 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 a few things. Uh, the AGM SGM notices are not in the in the standard clause. So we do have a checklist that that uh, I I may have provided you already, Tony, um, but I can always provide no, you. Send it to and, me. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, it's on our website as well. But it lists everything because there is a few things that are unique that we have started requesting that are not part of the 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 status quo. So the the AGM and SGM notice packages are one because they they contain often more valuable information than what's in the actual minutes. Sometimes. Themselves, right. um, uh, especially when it comes to like presidents' reports or council treasurers' reports or or quotes from contractors, um, those things of that nature. But another thing that's really interesting, which we just started doing probably in the last couple of years, is requesting a copy of the form V is in Victor, uh, which is the schedule of unit entitlement that's actually filed in land titles. And the reason why we started requesting this is because we found that about 35 to 40% of strata corporations actually aren't calculating their strata fees correctly. 
so oh, wow. as part of our service, we verify that the strata fee is actually right. And oftentimes we, we find errors in that. Um, most of the time it's fairly small, like it might be five or ten dollars difference, but every once in a while we see a building where there may be an eighty or a hundred dollar a month difference in their strata fees compared to what they actually should be paying. That's crazy. So if you actually point out that the the client your client that you're working with, if the strata fee should be more then obviously that buyer is not going to mention that, that to the strata corporation <laughs> because they don't want to increase their rates. But if it's yeah. less, they probably will be arguing that it should be less. Absolutely, yeah. And what, what happens after we provide the information, we don't have a part of that's completely <laughs> up to them. <that. laughs> and, and then in terms of like ordering the documents, I'm, I mean, as a listing agent, I'm paying for them. I'm assuming you're yeah, also I'm paying. paying Would too. you say that it is right for the listing agent to, to order and pay for it or should the buyer the clause says that you can put it on whoever but i just yeah i had one it. realtor like years ago <laughs> who insisted the 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 seller actually pays for it the seller pays for the the documents could. you could i mean it's ryan sad. what are your thoughts <laughs> You know what? I don't. I don't think I really have a strong opinion one way or the other because, because again, that that kind of goes back to you, you as realtors, uh, because you're all or mo mostly independent contractors. You get to decide on what your what your business model is going to be, right? So, um, I, yeah, I, I, I don't. I don't think I really feel strongly one way or the other. Uh, one of the, one of the things that I will say though is on the listing th side of things because typically it is the listing agent that's obtaining these documents and paying for them is that you can save yourself a great deal of money by being proactive and ordering those documents prior to the listing and refreshing that form be on a fairly regular basis uh, like if you have a property that's listed for a month or two without selling which doesn't happen a lot these days but if you get into that situation just just by default, reorder the Form B once it's starting to approach that 30-day period. Because uh, as you guys know, it's not necessarily the cost of the documents that, that kills you. It's the rush fees when you need a Form B in two days. <laughs> I mean, those Form Bs are expensive, though, too. I saw actually. one that was like $7,000. I don't know if it was a technical issue on mine. maybe. No, 7000 <laughs> I know, that's I crazy. showed you a picture of it. So, <laughs> <laughs> Ryan, what's the rule of thumb or guide for decision making on determining if like a strata is in a uh, in a healthy financial situation like CRF uh, the CRF I mean relative to the size of the strata yeah so I'll actually split this up into into two different sides right so you have your operating uh, budget and then you have your CRF so as far as the operating budget goes making sure that they're in a in a healthy financial situation that's that's easier than than determining that with the CRF really um, but from from the operating side of things, one of the big things that we look at is we look at how much the fees have increased over the last couple of years, whether or not they're seeing massive increases. So if we're seeing twenty percent increases year over year, that's a bit of a that's a bit of a concern. But it's also an equal amount of concern if there's no strata fee increases, because ultimately prices of everything are going up on an annual basis. And we do see strata corporations that you can tell through their minutes because they're patting themselves on the back continuously about how they've managed to keep their strata fees the same for the last four or five years. But to me, that's that's a big issue because it's it's kind of the um, uh, an ounce of prevention is worth a pound of cure kind of situation where if if they are cheaping out on their maintenance or deferring maintenance in favor of keeping their strata fees low, then that's just going to end up costing the owners more in the long run. And then that's when you start to get hit by these these big increases or 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 special levies, that sort of thing. Um, we also look for uh, if there's deficits in previous years and how the Strata Corporation is handling those deficits. One of the things that we highlight is if there is a deficit in the previous year and A, the Strata Corporation doesn't do anything, which they are required to take care of that in the following year as per the Strata Property Act, or if they're doing something like pulling the money out of their CRF to pay off their operating deficit, that's, that's not necessarily a, a good financial decision or a responsible financial decision either, uh, because now you're depleting your long-term savings because you didn't plan and budget accordingly, especially if you now you see that they're not increasing their fees to, to, to uh, cover that deficit that they had in the previous year. So from the operating side of things, that's what we look at. 
We also look at whether or not they have a large uh, accounts receivable balance. So if they have a big accounts receivable balance, that could be there could be a number of owners within the building that are not paying their strata fees and the strata corporation isn't actively doing anything to, to recover that money. Um, if they have a large accounts payable so that that can mean that they have a bunch of bills outstanding that they're not paying and that could indicate that there's some cash flow issues or just bad management they're just letting things lapse for three or four months before they decide that they want to write a check um, on the crf side of things that's a little bit more of a subjective question and this is something that we explain to, to buyers all the time because we almost every single review we get the question is there enough money in the crf well the answer to that is it depends. It depends on your opinion, right? Uh, in BC, there's no requirement to fully fund your CRF. There's no requirement to follow the funding models that are within the depreciation report. It's it's 100% up to the owners in that building to decide the strategy that that they think is best. Now, me personally, and I don't necessarily advocate this opinion to anybody else, but I've been an owner and investor in many strata corporations uh, in since I've been an adult, and I personally don't like having a fully funded CRF. I'd rather have a healthy CRF, um, but also have the potential for some hybrid with special levies as well, because especially from, from an investment standpoint is I don't necessarily want to be subsidizing work that's going to happen 25 years from now when I'm not actually um, an owner in the building. Now, Again, not saying that's right. A lot of people may disagree with that. Um, some strata corporations take almost a hundred percent special levy approach, which I don't recommend either. Uh, but that's kind of the beauty of strata corporations in BC is that they are they are small democracy, democracies where the owners get to choose how they decide want to move forward. This might be a difficult question, but in your opinion, what would be some red flags to look for when reviewing a depreciation report? Because I think it depends on the year of build too, right? There's always normal things that yeah. are going to come up. Yeah. The, the biggest, as far as red flags go, um, and that's, I mean, it's, it's red flags in and of itself is a commonly used term. We often get asked by realtors and buyers, like, what are the red flags? And, and I prefer to say points of interest or points of concern, because to me, a red flag is, is like, this is definitely a very bad thing. Whereas most things, there's more nuance to it than that, than that. Right. Um, but as far as something that I would definitely say is a red flag, and we, we run into this on occasion, and I don't want to say this is a, this is a, very common thing, but it is a very serious thing where we do run across it. But we do have strata corporations that are omitting certain components from their depreciation report. Oh, so um, typically how we see that is we'll 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 get a copy of the depreciation report. The engineer or the consultant that drafted the depreciation report will have a list of all the components. And then they might have a note on certain things that'll say something like omitted at request of the strata council. <laughs> and wow. they're, they're probably probably that yeah it's 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 i mean it's straight up fraudulent as far as i'm concerned um but i had one strata corporation which was probably the most egregious case of this where um they had a depreciation report done there was a number of large components like the building envelope the roof uh, i can't remember what else but it was to the tune of approximately 2.8 million dollars which just happened to bring the strata corporation into within being fully funded as far as their crf or their or their funding models in that depreciation report went so to me that's that's a that's a huge concern uh and definitely definitely a red flag because that at that point the council is either um, just completely ignorant to, to what their job is, or they're straight up being fraudulent with misrepresenting the building. For sure. And that's to protect the asset, like the for future sales? I, 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 I mean, I can't speak to what their motivations are, but um, one of the one of the words of warning that I often say to buyers and realtors is oftentimes throughout the course of this process, you say, oh, let's try and get a hold of the council president, or let's try and get a hold of a council member or the man or the, the strata manager. Um, and then they have a conversation, they get butterflies, it's like, oh, yeah, this is a great building. They said it's a great building, and they seem really proactive. But you have to remember that there, that's that that opinion is not an unbiased opinion. The the the, the strata manager, the the council president, the council members have a vested interest in making that building appear as good as possible, right? 
So that's why we don't, uh, often it, the question comes up is, oh, do you talk to the strata manager? Do you talk to the council? No, there's, there's absolutely no value in it for us to do so. If it's not stated explicitly in the documents, then, then I really don't care what they have to say. What's the most complicated or messiest file you've ever dealt with? <laughs> um, there's actually two on the island that I won't name specifically, um, but the, the, the realtors that are local to Victoria will probably know. Uh, there's one that's a very large um, bare land strata. It's, it's uh, oh, what is it, like 600 and some lots. It's basically a small municipality. They have a coffee shop. They have a fire hall. They have, like, it's it's a municipality. I don't even know why it's a strata corporation, but it is it, it, incredibly complicated. Uh, up until recently, they, they were essentially self-managed as well. They didn't even have a, a, a licensed strata management company attached to them. So that one um, is very complicated. It's also about uh, the standard... Form B package is 200 to 400 pages. Uh, I think theirs ended up being about 1,300 or 1,400 oh pages. Gosh. Wow. Yeah. Um, I actually ducked doing that review for about three years. Every time it came up or every time we had a request, I said, I'm sorry, we're just, we can't do it unless you want to pay thousands of dollars. But one of, uh, one of my colleagues, one of my licensees, Mugarel, he said, you know what? It, it, we get requested for it enough that I'll, I'll just do it. And then, and then we have the, the basis. We have the foundation for doing reviews at least going forward, right? Um, the, the second one is also in Victoria. It's, a, it's an oceanfront building. It's a gorgeous building. They recently went through a, a lot of um, building envelope issues. It's about 15-ish years old. Um, the council is, it's unique because the, the, the level of experience on the council is, is very high. There's engineers, there's lawyers, there's, there's, uh, accountants, like there's presumably who you'd want on your strata councils on there. The, the kind of downside of that is their documents are ridiculously detailed. Like there is, there is way more information than what is actually needed. And it's not summarized in a, in a, in a very, good way. So that document package is actually about 1700, 1800 pages, which the, the very <laughs> first time I reviewed it, it took me, it took me two and a half days to get all that stuff. And, and oh, no. uh, I wanted to jump out of a window afterwards, but, <laughs> but now you but know, we got through it and <laughs> now we know, and it is, it, now we have the basis, we have the foundation for that. So we can use that information going forward. And we do, do, we do it on a fairly regular basis. So it's not, it's typically not that painful to get caught up with three or four months of of, of information. Um, our last question in regards to document packages, we were talking about the Form B and information possibly provided on the Form B. It's very frustrating on the trading services side um, to discern or decipher sometimes what the parking and storage is and how it's designated. Uh, some of the property management companies out here no longer put it in the package, even though they're supposed to from, no way, uh, yeah, they, don't? they started doing it. Wow. And some of the companies out here on the first page of a form B now will say that nobody can rely on the information in the form B. So my question mm -hmm. is for somebody selling condos, how are we supposed to know if the property management companies are not going to supply that information Two, did they have to supply the information or was there a material change? And three, what suggestions do you have for strata corporations or developers to improve on this? It's very frustrating. I mean, I've, I've seen disclaimers on Form B saying that we are relying on the information that was provided by the strata corporation. So it is a bit of a uh, mitigating the liability on behalf of the management company. Whether or not that would be effective if some if there was a lawsuit or a, or, or a complaint or something along those lines, I, I really don't know, to be honest with you. Um, but yeah, as far as the Form B goes, it is a binding form. Like that, the information on that is intended for the buyers to rely upon to make their decision. And if there is errors on that, there again, I'm not a lawyer, but I, I would assume that there's some basis for for a, a lawsuit or, or potentially damages because of that erroneous information. Um, the other thing too, and we see this on a fairly regular basis, is there's some management companies that are kind of creating their own form B. So you might see like it's all condensed into one page, but oftentimes it's missing information. Uh, and my contention with that is that the form B is a prescribed form under the Strata Property Act. Prescribed form means you have to use that specific form. You can't amend it. You can't remove things, et cetera, et cetera. So um, if you're seeing 
this on a regular basis, you're seeing strata management companies that are refusing to provide that information. I mean, quite honestly, that's something I would talk to A, your managing broker about, and B, potentially the BCFSA, because they're not fulfilling their their fiduciary contractual obligations at that point. As far as how to make things better, because there is right now, the biggest confusion with parking is typically with common property parking stalls that were designated as a long-term leases. Yeah. So this is this is a loophole that goes back probably 15-ish, 20, 20 years at this point, where um, technically under the Strata Property Act, that practice isn't legal. But it's a it's kind of a loophole because what happens is the, the developers prior to forming the Strata Corporation uh, lease out that parking area to a third party company. Uh, and then once the Strata Corporation is created, because the lease predates the Strata Corporation, now the Strata Corporation is beholden to that lease. Um, this is a practice that has been fought in court many times. Nobody likes it. It doesn't benefit anybody except for the developers. But there was some recommendations back in um late 2019, early 2020, I guess. And it was, this happened just before COVID. So it, it got a little bit of media attention, but then COVID hit and, and, and it kind of fell off the radar, of course. But there was a number of recommendations from the Canadian Law or BC Law Institute on changes to the Strata Property Act. We're seeing some of those being instituted now as far as the age restriction and rental restriction bylaws. Um, from what I hear, there is some stuff coming down the pipeline potentially within the next couple months in regards to depreciation reports uh, and getting rid of the, the, the option to waive a depreciation report. Um, also clarifying who who can do a depreciation report because right now it's kind of the wild west and and unfortunately there are some some providers of depreciation reports out there that really have no business doing it and they're not no. worth anything <laughs> <laughs> when it comes yeah, right wow. down to it um, um so as far as making things better there is some recommendations in there and and uh one of which is expressly disallowing this practice of having long-term leases on common property. However, they also want to change it so that limited common property parking stalls can be reallocated easier than they currently are. So it, 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 it addresses both the what the developers want to do, and I understand why they want to do it. And it, it does benefit buyers as well, because when you're buying into a brand new building, you want the ability to pick and choose your parking stalls or buy an extra one if you want. Um, as it is right now, that's very difficult with long, limited common property because you need to now refile that every time there's a change to that limited common property, which is a pain in the butt and there's expenses involved and, and that sort of stuff. So the recommendations, and I don't specifically remember what they were, but um, I do remember thinking that that should address both the problems of the confusion around the parking stalls as well as leave it flexible enough for those parking stalls to be allocated in a reasonable way. I'll look forward to seeing those recommendations. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Ryan, you were mentioning the cost was approximately $400. What, what size of a package does that look like? Do you charge per page, per hour? And uh, my other question is, if you've already reviewed the strata documents uh, for a previous client of yours... And now you're really just picking up from where you had left off. Let's just say, you know, you're someone's buying in the same building a, a week later and you've already reviewed it. Are you charging less or are you just charging the same amount? So, no, we are charging the same amount, but uh, let's let's go back. So so typical form B package is 200 to 400 pages. Our, our, our fees, um, we've got a couple different levels of review, but the, the most comprehensive, most popular option, probably 80 percent of the reviews we do are the level two review is 445. Um, my my philosophy when I started Condo Clear, and you can see this like our website is very simple. I try to make things as straightforward and simple as possible. So we do operate predominantly on that flat fee basis rather than number of pages, et cetera. There are some caveats to that. Like if it's a section building, we have to do two re reviews rather than one. So we do charge an extra fee for that, but you don't have to pay for two completely separate reviews. Um, if it's a really big package, like 1,200 pages, et cetera, then there is additional costs to um, doing anything above 400 or 450 pages. Um, but we try try to keep that, that flat fee uh, because it's just simpler for everybody in the end. And that leads to the second part of your question that, so yeah, if we just did a review a week ago, we're still charging the same amount for a couple reasons is because you're paying for our, our expertise, right? Uh, but 
the bigger reason for me is that there's anytime we're involved in, in advising on, on strata documents, there's liability for us. So quite frankly, if I'm only going to charge a hundred or $200, it's not worth the potential risk for us to do that. So that's why we, we, we maintain the same, same level of pricing across the board. Makes sense. And what does, once you're reviewing the report and you're summarizing everything, what does that report look like? Is it almost like a re- inspection report? It's, it's like a shorter form of the... There is, there is uh, a sample report if you go onto our website or I, I, I can send you one, but it's, it's online. So the, the, the buyers and the realtor will receive an email with a link. So you click on that link, put your name in, uh, and then it'll go through. We have we have a section right at the beginning is is key considerations. So th- those are just things that we highlight as not necessarily red flags, but just important stuff to look at. Um, and the other thing too is people often just expect that we're going to point out all the bad things in the Strata Corporation, but our goal is to give you a good idea or a good feel for what's going on in the Strata, not necessarily just pointing out all the red flags. So if there's things that the Strata is doing that are awesome we are totally going to include that as well. Like we're going to give props to these councils and these, these strata corporations that are doing a really good job. Um, so that just helps to reinforce people's decision to, to move forward. Uh, we break down the depreciation part, and this is probably one of the, one of the most useful things we do is again, going back to, there's no requirement for strata corporations to follow the funding models in the depreciation report. And very rarely do they, I mean, once in a blue moon, we're talking probably, five percent of the time you have a strata corporation that's actively following the 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 funding models so what we do is we take what we know which is the current balance of the crf we know how much they're contributing on an annual basis we put that into a table along with the uh estimates from the depreciation report and we actually create basically our own funding model and then we break it down based on the unit entitlement of the of the strata lot in question, and we project any potential special levies over the next 10 years, again, broken down to what the individual cost is for your clients. Uh, and then we go to go another step further. And this was actually um, a, a suggestion of a couple of realtors in Victoria at our at our recent trade show in February. Uh, Vanessa Roman and Tracy Menzies came up to our booth and we're chatting, and I've known both of them for, for quite a while. And they said, hey, Hey, could you add in a section on your de- depreciation report how much people would have to save on a monthly basis to cover their strata to cover their special levies? And I said, yeah, that's a great idea. So now that's part of our report. So it'll break down and say fifteen thousand dollars worth of special levies over the next ten years if you put away two hundred and fifty dollars a month, then that'll cover you. That's fantastic. Uh, before we summarize and go do go into our really fun round, which takes about two minutes, you did mention that you're working on a new business. Can you share what that is, or is there anything else that you would want to say about our industry? Uh, yeah. So as far as the new business that uh, we're working on in the infancy stages at this point, it's been a, a bit of a something I've thought about probably for the last four or five years, um, haven't really actioned anything up until the last few months. And it is going to be a strata management uh, company. It's going to be separate from condo clear. Um, but the approach that we're taking, and I can't, I can't speak in too many details about it, but it's going to be completely different approach from the traditional management model, which I think is, is flawed in, in many ways. Um, from, from a realtor's perspective, where you may be very interested in it is it's a big part of it is going to be based on, on clarity and transparency. So things like the documents will be available to all the owners and their realtors, et cetera, constantly, like in a, on a real time basis. So there won't be, you won't have to go through these different companies to request the documents. Um, what I'm hoping, and I can't promise this right now, but, but what I'm hoping to achieve is not even charging for documents, uh, aside from the form B and the form F, which will charge because it takes effort for us to, to actually draft those. But the documents that are just sitting there on a database, I mean, there, there really is no effort for us to provide those. So what are you paying for at that point? So that's going to be one of one of our goals is having that information freely and widely available to anybody that wants it to, to help you out. Um, 
there's there's i mean i could go on go into it a, a lot more detail but i think it's better to to leave it as a as a tease i'm hoping within the next three to six months we'll have more information ryan we can have you on again once that business is up and running and then you can speak to the business at that time i Perfect. was yeah. thinking you were going to say i wasn't expecting what you were going to say but i thought you were going to say you're going to be a consultant for mm. Strata Council, for Strata Corporations, <laughs> to how to operate more efficiently. Just, you know, even just like the suggestions about how to how much money to save. Um, that, to me, would be a very good investment um, for most Strata Corporations. Y you know what? So, so uh, funny you should say that, because in the early days of, of Condo Clear, before the document review side of things really became as busy as it is, I did do a lot of consulting, and that was a, a pretty significant part of my business. It was probably probably about 40% of my business was doing consulting specifically for self-managed strata corporations, because there is a huge need for that. Um, the reason why I don't do that anymore is, is twofold. A, we got so ridiculously busy on the strata document review side of things uh, was the primary reason. But the secondary reason is, um, how to say this in a diplomatic way, oftentimes strata owners don't fully understand what's going on in their buildings. So when decisions are happening and there's a management company or a consultant attached to, them, to it, they automatically assume that it's their fault. But the reality is, is that the council are the ones making the decisions. The management companies have no authority whatsoever, typically speaking. Mm -hmm. It's the, it's the council. So whether or not your, your, your building is good or bad or otherwise is typically on the shoulders of the, the council. So, from a from a public relations standpoint, I didn't want the excellent reputation that we were building with Condo Clear to be tainted by owners in build buildings that we're consulting for going on Google and saying, "Oh, they gave me a bylaw fine, so there's a one star review." So I, I really wanted to maintain um, the integrity of Condo Clear, and it's it's difficult to do that when you're also providing strategic consulting services. But with this new venture, that may very well be a part of our services is 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 adding that consulting component in. I love this. I'm so excited for you, Ryan. Thank you for sharing that. We are in our final round. Um, are you okay to answer five of our rapid fire questions? Say whatever first sure, comes to mind. Okay, great. Uh, what kind of change would you like to see when it comes to strata document issues? I think we covered that, but really quick. <laughs> uh, well, more transparency. Ultimately, what do you like to do in your spare time when not reading strata documents? <laughs> uh, hiking, gym, anything outside. I play various sports, um, adventures in general. What is your favorite book or movie? Good question. There's so many. Well, movies easy. Braveheart. I'm I am I am Scottish by descent, so Braveheart has always been one of my favorites. As far as book goes, uh, I read a lot of books, so that would be it'd be hard for me to pick one. Okay. If you could switch jobs or lives with someone for a day, who would it be and why? Oh, man. Uh, you know what? I would, if it was just for one day, it would be really interesting to see uh, what a day in the life of Elon Musk would be like. Because mm -hmm. quite frankly, um, I'm, I'm slightly in awe of him. Um, and I don't know how he operates on a daily basis. Like he just has so much stuff going on. But that's it's not a life I would ever want for myself. But it would be really interesting to, to check it out for a day. Last question. Where can our listeners find you? Uh, condoclear.ca is our, is our website. Uh, we, like I said, we have a great newsletter that we send out on a weekly basis. That is 95% educational content. It's not a bunch of promotional stuff. We're trying to provide real value with, with knowledge and information. Uh, email address is info at condoclear.ca and, uh, Facebook, LinkedIn, all those things, Instagram. We've got those as well. Okay. Awesome. Right. Thank you so much for joining us today. Thanks, Ryan. I'm filling out the form as we speak. <laughs> Perfect. No, th you. thank you for having me. This is great. This is this is. I've done I've done radio interviews and and various uh, videos for YouTube and and websites and that sort of stuff. But this is my very first podcast. Oh, so oh thank well you for done. Me. <laughs> thank you.